Hey, welcome back to 65 Drums. My name is Justin. Today I wanna to do a video taking apart a bunch of vintage electronic drums and see how they're built and what's inside of them. A while ago on the channel, I made a video taking apart a bunch of modern pads. So some mesh pads, some rubber pads, and even an Elisa Sample Pad Pro. So basically the kind of electronic drums that you can buy today, new at Guitar Center or something like that. But now I wanna see where it all started with a bunch of vintage electronic drum pads. The first commercial electronic drums came out in the 70s, and what I have in my collection of vintage drum pads is mostly 80s stuff. So the first major wave of improvements, I have a Roland PD-11 kick drum, a PD-31 snare drum pad. I also have two pads from the Soviet Union. One's called, I think, Formata, and the other one is called Marsh. And I also have a Tama Techstar pad, a Simmons uh, a SDS-9 pad, and then finally, I have a Simmons Hexapad. Okay, so this is the Roland PD-31 pad. This was made in 1987, and it was the second snare pad Roland had ever made. Uh, they, they made the PD-20s, which were the first ones back in 1985, and two years later, this was like the new and improved version. And this is significantly different because it has four zones. This thing has a zone here, here, and here. This is really weird when you're playing it because you'd assume that these rubber pads right here was the actual zone. But no, you're supposed to hit these shoulder plastic pieces. This right here is incredibly, incredibly hard. If you play this long term, your wrists will hurt unless you're playing very lightly. This is a very small playing surface compared to like a Simmons pad. So it's literally the same size, but because because it's not a triangle, uh, you actually can play more of the drum. Also, I notice hot spotting on this. If I play over here, it is significantly less sensitive than just two inches over here. You can actually see where the center piezo is. There's like a ghost image right there of it. So if you completely take apart this pad, you gotta be really careful with it. Everything sort of like flops all over the place when you try to flip this over. I was having some trouble uh, originally trying to remove this. It's kind of hidden. Uh, there's no screws here. You have to pop it out of its place by removing these these uh, pieces of rubber here and sort of trying to get underneath one of the one of the exposed edges with a screwdriver and trying to pop one part out so you can slowly work uh, the back plate off of this. Also, I should mention, this is still its original color. It's like an off-white. For example, my kick drum from the same drum set, it can turn a really, really ugly yellow. You can use products like RetroBright to bring the original color back. Thankfully, the color didn't age. So as you can see on the inside of this pad, there's a very, very large center piezo, much, much larger than these tiny little piezos that they have for the different rim zones. And then everything is wired to four inputs. You gotta use four cables. That's a very large chunk of the drum module. And they could have just used two cables and had two rim zones and two head zones. But maybe, maybe modules at the time weren't really that sophisticated and they couldn't really do that. For various reasons, they decided to have four cables. I ended up just using it as a single zone pad most of the time, but I did test out the four zones and they all do work. It's just kind of awkward to play in the rim zones because you're literally just hitting a piece of exposed plastic. There's no rubber on it, but there is rubber on the inside. They have duct tape holding down the wires and underneath the plate that you're actually hitting is a piece of wood and then that's covered by a very, very dense, I guess very, very thin piece of rubber on top of it. This is really, really complicated for a pad in 1987. Actually kind of complicated for a pad even today. Four piezos on a snare isn't something that you normally see. And the small piezos, the only other time I've really seen this recently is on an Elisa Sample Pad Pro that I used to own. A ton of these small piezos. So I don't see those very much, and this is more uh, close to what I normally see in electronic drums today. Okay, so let's move ahead to the next pad. This is a Simmons SDS-9 pad from 1985, so two years before that Roland pad. Uh, the drum set that this came on sold for about $1,995. Not sure if that was a list price or an actual everyday price, but uh, yeah, this is like a step down, I believe, from the SDS-7. I didn't really understand how to take this apart, so I literally had to go look that up uh, because there aren't any visible screws on the front of this pad. The only thing you can really see is that you can use a uh, drum key to tighten down where the mount for the tom is. Uh, that's the only access point in this entire pad. Playing surface isn't really half bad, especially for 1985, really, really not that bad at all. I enjoy playing on it much more than the Roland one, actually. I was trying to clean this a while ago to take photos and video of it, and unfortunately, you gotta make sure you don't use a mag magic eraser on this. 
because if you use a magic eraser on the logo area, you can remove some of the paint as you can see around where the S is. Thankfully, this is not a super rare pad or anything like that, but I wish I was a little bit more careful in that regard. Big thank you to the Simmons guy, that's an account over on Instagram, for letting me know what kind of pad this was. Because there are no markings at all on the surface or the back of this pad, that was the only way I could figure out what kind of drum set this came from. Because a lot of Simmons pads do look uh, very similar to me, unless you know very specific things about them. To get the shell off, you have to reach your finger inside right here and sort of pop off uh, the back part of it or take a screwdriver and sort of, you know, put pressure to remove the plate. So anyway, this is the inside of the pad. And as you can tell, it's a lot simpler than the Roland one. It only has one piezo. It's like a one zone Tom pad, I believe. And it's right, it's right there. It is slathered in a ton of glue. I'm guessing that's like a safety precaution. Because if you're playing live, the only thing that can go that can really go wrong with an electronic drum pad of this simple design is that the wires connecting to the piezo can come loose or the wires going to the input jack can come loose. So they just completely covered them in glue. I don't even know what the playing surface is, but it appears to be glued on to this piece of particle board or whatever that board is. All right, let's move on to the next pad. All right, so this next drum is the Simmons Hexahead from 1992. Now this drum is drastically different than that other Simmons pad that we took apart uh, that was made about seven years before this one. As you can tell, the main difference is the fact that you're actually playing on an 11 inch acoustic drum head. Most of the resources out there, like the Simmons Museum and like the Simmons books, they'll mention that they only came with Evans heads for the most part. But I guess maybe I have a slightly rare one because this one is a Remo Weather King Ambassador batter head. So anyway, if you remove the rim, it's actually completely made out of plastic. And then, you, of course, you have the Remo drum head. And then you also have a piece of foam underneath that. And this piece of foam and the other piece of foam underneath that make this a much, much more comfortable playing experience over the older Simmons pads. This doesn't have the amount of articulation as the older Simmons pads, like uh, being able to do really fast rolls with your fingers is a little bit harder on this because it has more of a pillowy type feel to it. What you get in return is no pain in your wrists. So you have a, a fairly thin but dense piece of foam. You have a piece of metal underneath that. And then you also have another piece of foam under the metal. So that's actually a little bit smaller than the main piezo inside of the roll-on pad and a little bit smaller than the main piezo and the older Simmons pad as well. This little basket piece. Underneath that, you have the plastic shell. Um, the wiring goes down through this little access point in the middle and then snakes over to the sensitivity dial. And then it runs from here over to the main input jack right there. So I don't know how well you can see all this, but that is what the inside of a Simmons hexahead pad looks like. And this was the only time that Simmons had made uh, acoustic drum head pads with their electronic design since like the Simmons SDS-3 or SDS-4 days back in the, I believe that was mostly in the 70s, but maybe slightly also sold into the 80s as well. But they had abandoned the acoustic drum head concept before they went back to it in the 90s. Uh, this was the 90s logo. The company Simmons is actually not one company. They went through a lot of iterations because They'd have a brand, it would go bankrupt, or they'd have to sell it off to somebody else. And then Dave Simmons would create another one, and then that would go bankrupt. So there's a lot of different iterations of Simmons. But the most popular version of Simmons was the one in around like 1985, that version of Simmons. And that's the older logo that has the oval around the name. And because that was the most popular version of the Simmons brand, uh, that's what Guitar Center is using as their logo with their Simmons branded drum sets. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so unfortunately this next pad, I don't have an exact date. This was made somewhere in the Soviet Union, somewhere around the 80s, but as you can tell from the overall shape and the overall look, it is heavily inspired by Simmons. Most people were trying to make something that looked like a Simmons pad. And in fact, a lot of times these Soviet uh, instrument engineer people, they would literally borrow synthesizer instruments from bands that were going through the Soviet Union doing like musical tours. They would reverse engineer them, give them back to the bands, and then they would create something very, very similar. And it's using a bunch of screws around each side. All right, so you have a metal rim that goes all the way around. It's sort of just like sitting there. There's nothing really holding it from what I can tell. 
Okay, so I've finally gotten this thing apart, and here's what the internals look like. It's very, very sparse. So here's the top plate, and it's actually very, very thin. You're basically hitting this piece of, I guess, particle board. Now the piezo is interesting. It's got a ton of this mysterious white glue on it. I'm sure some of you in the comments probably know what it is, but I have no idea what it is. It's been hardening for decades, but it's got a slightly gummy feel if you dig your fingernail into it. You have a little screw holding the cable down in place. This cable is really, really thick uh, compared to some of the other cables running from the piezo to the input jack that we've seen from other companies. That plate is sitting on top of this board right here. You have all these little, these little uh, pieces of foam that are offering some cushion. The piezo cable runs down through there. And then if you remove this plate, you'll see that this is what's on the other side of it. This entire shell is made out of solid metal, as you'd expect. Uh, from a Soviet pad. The only thing that was holding this plate to the shell right there is a piece right over here somewhere. This guy that was poking out of this hole right here. And to be honest, I kind of hate this thing because it makes stacking this pad very, very difficult. Maybe it's some sort of way to tighten uh, some sort of arm that goes in to hold this as a tom mount. Very, very simple design, but fairly hard to break. So I have to give a shout out to a website called rustkeys.net. It was very helpful during my research of this drum pad. It's essentially the Wikipedia for Soviet era synthesizers. They have everything. There's actually an entry for this drum set. It's labeled the March UDS. We can see multiple photos of the drum brain itself uh, with all the dials and knobs and everything. We can also see a complete photo of the drum set. It looks like it was sold with the snare, kick, three toms, and then a hi-hat pad, maybe a ride cymbal, depending on how you tune the sound itself. And finally, what I find most cool about this particular page is they actually have a copy of the manual. Here you can see the original carrying case or possibly uh, what it was shipped in. And then over here, we start to see some diagrams showing where to plug in your headphones, where to plug in the pads, uh, plugging into speakers, all that, you know, really basic stuff. This right here is a diagram of basically the drum brain itself and what all the different knobs did. And I ran it through a program called Google Lens basically Google Translate, but for images. And this is the result that it gave me. It looks like there's an extra component over there on the left side, and I'm not exactly sure what that is. And then we have a few pages of text. This has a lot of basic things about how to achieve different sounds, what the different knobs do. And also it reminds you over there on the right hand side of the page to write down the position of the knobs if you get a sound that you really, really like. And then of course we have a page just talking about the warranty of these drums. And then we see a very, very detailed schematic of the internals. I'm not sure if this is something that electronic drum companies back then regularly included with their manuals, but I can tell you uh, they don't actually show this stuff in current manuals now for Roland or Yamaha drums. Interestingly, it looks like this drum set was called the Marsh B232. Now that translation is different from the regular website page, which calls this the March. So I'm not sure if it's actually called the Marsh or the March. We get a table of contents showing exactly what comes with it. You get the case, you get some spare parts. I don't wanna dive into every single word of every single page, but I thought some of you might find this interesting. Okay, so next up we have another Soviet pad, and this is the Formanta UDS pad. Here's what it looks like all around before I start taking it apart. All right, can I just say, I hate the fact that this is using flathead screws for an electronic drum pad. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Anyway, so this pad is a lot different than that other one, the Marsh pad, because the playing zone feels different. I think this rubber is a little bit thicker. It's got that circular inner trench, and also this has a plastic back. So as you can tell, this is 100% different than the other one. So let's see what's inside. No cables, okay. All right, wow. That is way different than that Marsh pad. Man. Okay, so I'm still coming to grips with this design. Uh, it's very, very different. I've never seen an electronic drum pad uh, exactly like this. You got this spider arm design here, like a starfish that is metal, but around that you have the plastic shell. And then you have all the cabling going from the input jack over to the piezo, and there's like this this piece of rubber that is protecting the piezo and has a little cutout for the cable right there because it's sitting on top of a pure piece of metal. And you can actually see a slight uh, uh, outline where the piezo is. 
And then on top of this metal piece, you have uh, the, the rubber playing zone and it's apparently glued onto the metal. And then there's foam around the edges of this design. So very, very interesting. They've also used bits of string to tie the cable in place here and here. This is kind of like a strange housing for the piezo sensor. This feels like a like rubber. Let me try to give you a close-up view of the piezo sensor and what it looks like. Very, very interesting design. So it's pretty obvious to me that these were made by completely different uh, teams of people, probably in different factories. And they may have even come out at different points in history, although they are still like, you know, the 80s, maybe, maybe early 90s era of electronic drums. Um, this just seems more sophisticated to me than the Marsh pad over here. Not that I'm trying to review electronic drums from a different country than mine in the 1980s. Obviously, pick up whatever you want. You're buying vintage electronic drums more for sentimental reasons than actual I need something that performs reasons. This is the Tama Techstar T5100. This came on the drum set called the TS500 kit. And this is a Tom pad, single zone. This came out in 1984. There's a later version of this kit with pads that look kind of similar to this, but they're more of a square shape. And that is the TAK500 kit that came out in 1985, the very next year. So when you saw that video from the channel Drumeo where they were unboxing a Tama Techstar kit, it was essentially this drum set right here, but it came the generation the year right afterwards with the squarish pads. All right, let's take this apart. Okay, so the first layer is the drum head. Unfortunately, I don't know exactly who made this drum head, but it's just a regular acoustic drum head. The second layer underneath that is a very thin piece of dense foam, similar to what uh, Simmons was doing, but this is even thinner than that one. Underneath that, you have a piece of particle board with two screws in it. I wanna be careful here because, yep, I believe there is the piezo underneath of that. And it's like in this, this weird squarish contraption, and there's a piece of very, very thin foam underneath that as like isolation, I believe, and then staples, and then like this guard piece to, uh, to keep the, the cable from coming free. And those are the two solder points. It looks like there's some writing on this. So let me see if I can get this closer on camera. I can You can zoom in on it, but it looks like this was made by Fuji. Everything is sitting on these very, very squishy blocks of foam. And the result of all of this is a very, very hard playing experience. Let me tell you, this looks similar to the Simmons pad from 1992 on the outside, that uh, hexapad, but this feels nowhere near as nice as the Simmons one. The Simmons one has much thicker pieces of foam and you can really feel the difference. This just doesn't feel as premium as the Simmons one, unfortunately. But hey, it's nice to have this in the collection and it looks kind of cool. Um, other than that, you can see the cable running straight to the input jack. You have the mount right there. Unfortunately, the screw is missing from the mount, so I can't actually mount this on anything. It's a very large pad. They force the hexagon shape on this, and it has a very wide rim, so it takes up more real estate than it really needs to for an 11-inch playing surface. I'm glad I have this in my collection, but it's not really my favorite overall. It has a nice, cool look, though. Okay, so this last pad, I kind of struggled on whether or not to include this in the video because um, taking this apart did not go exactly the way that I was hoping. It's the sister pad to that PD-31 uh, on the drum set that came out in 1987. So this is how this pad comes apart. You have a lot of screws that are holding this weird rubber piece that goes all the way around. So you gotta take apart all those screws. Then you have this, this shell, which is turned yellow, but I can fix that later on if I want to. You remove the shell, and then you have these these uh, these clamps that go to the legs. You can remove those. And then you have a big honking piece of particle board. You have the giant piezo. As you can see, there's a lot of glue going around that. And then you have the playing surface. There is a piece of rubber on the other side, but it's basically a piece of wood, a very thin like veneer piece of wood right there, and maybe some metal that I can't see from this side of things. Uh, these, these like wet spots around some of the screws. I was trying to use WD-40 because I couldn't remove some of the screws. They're kind of just stuck there. And then this is the input jack, which has a plastic housing. You can technically use two kick drum beaters with this, but I found that it didn't give you the best results. Um, but you can make it work if you really need to. To be honest, I'm not a fan of this design at all, mostly because they were using particle board here and the fact that they have so many screws everywhere. 25 screws, and it's all into particle board. 
But anyway, that is the PD-11 kick drum pad made in Japan. Roland's second ever electronic kick drum. Hey, by the way, thanks for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. If you liked this video, you might want to check out my History of Electronic Drums documentary series. It has six episodes and has covered the history of e-drums from the 1960s all the way to current day. Also, I made a first part of this video a couple of years ago where I took apart modern electronic drum pads and is a nice companion video to this one. So you can see how electronic drums in the 80s are and then see what they're like in the 2010s. And then finally, I really recommend these two books if you're interested in vintage electronic drums. The first one is called Electronic Drum Facts, and the other one is called The Complete Simmons Drum Guide. They're really, really good, and they're written by a guy named Alex Graham. I've linked to those videos and also those two books down in the description below. Also want to give a big shout out to the recent supporter Drummer Geek over on Patreon.com for helping support 65 drums over there and helping make this channel happen, especially in this crazy year. Have an amazing day, guys, and I'll see you all in a few.